Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's budget workshop. This evening, we are beginning with a special guest speaker. Mr. David Little is here with us. He's here to discuss the fiscal crisis in New York State and the impact that it's having on our education system. Mr. Little has directed NISBA's governmental relations department since November of 1999. He's a graduate of Wittenberg University and the Capital University Law School. They previously served as counsel in both the New York State Assembly and Senate. His most recent position was Home Rule Counsel and Counsel to the Majority Leader for Local Government. <laughs> Dave also served nine years on the Britain Hill Board of Education, the last seven as its president. In addition, Dave has served on the Rensselaer County Legislature the Capital District Regional Planning Commission, and the Board of Directors of the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Dave lives in Brunswick with his wife, Lynn. Their sons, Patrick and Daniel, attend John Hopkins University and the Rochester Institute of Technology, respectively. Please help me in welcoming Mr. David Little. He and Johns Hopkins. I'll put a little basket at the back of the room and if you'd all drop some meat at the back, you can help pay that off. If you know um, if you know anything about me, you know that we're gonna start this with a story. I always you know, I always have a story. Many of you may remember uh, Jim Croce, the folk singer back in the 70s. You don't mess around with Jim, an operator, and bad, bad people running around. What a lot of people don't know is that Jim Croce was a long-haul truck driver before he became a folk singer and his partner was honored on the Phil Donahue show back in the 70s for driving two million accident-free miles in a tractor trailer. That's 100,000 miles a year in, a, in an 18-wheeler for 20 years without having an accident. And so Donahue wanted to use him to illustrate, um, and this is hard, this is kind of a cultural time war, but if you think back to the early 70s, those of you who were alive, you'll remember that it was all about CB radios and truck drivers and, and it, was a, it was a big deal. So they had this guy on and Donahue wanted to show how quick-witted and the fast reflexes that these truck drivers have on the road. And so he wanted to set up a scenario to give to this truck driver to find out how he'd react so that the audience could get a sense of that. And the truck driver agreed. So Donahue said, you're going down a long straightaway in the Rocky Mountains, and at the bottom of the straightaway, there's a hairpin turned to the left, and up on the right-hand berm, there's a guy changing his tire right on the edge of the road. And the guy said, okay. And Donnie, you said, now you go to hit your brakes, and you've got nothing. You've got no brakes whatsoever. And the guy said, all right. He said, now coming up half in your lane and half in the other lane, there's a tanker truck full of gasoline coming at you. What do you do? And without hesitating, the guy said, I'd wake up my partner. And Donnie, you said, with all of that going on, in the middle of that crisis, you'd wake up your partner, why would you take that kind of time? And the truck driver said, well, he hasn't been driving all that long, and I'm pretty sure he's never seen a wreck like we're about to have. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don described kind of some of the things that I've done over the years. I started in the state legislature in 1983. I was a school board member for nearly a decade, and then I had to stop that to start working for the State School Boards Association. So the 17 years that I put into the state legislature, I say was that was I was part of the problem, and so now this is penance for what I had done being part of the problem back then. Now is the wreck like I've never seen before. So almost 30 years, I've been through what happened in the early 90s where we had mid-year cuts. We had cuts to education back then. We had to recalibrate our expenses. Uh, along with the revenues that were available at the time, and we did that kind of thing, and we got innovative. But it was a different time, and we were allowed to prioritize in a way that was much more individualized per school district, for each individual school district, than we're allowed to do now. Now, common testing, common standards, common core curriculum, there are a lot of reasons for standardization that require you to do a lot more things than we had to do back then. I always said that when we started the standards movement, that our own school stopped being great so that we could be good. And that's kind of what's happened over the course of this crisis, except to a much more severe degree. So I want to give you a little bit of, of history here to put all of this in a context, hopefully to try and give you some perspective on, on what every school district in New York is going through right now and the kind of 
kind of fundamental overhaul that they're looking at in what we do. So let me take you back a little bit. How many of you have seen the movie City Slickers with Billy Crystal? Anybody? In that movie, they keep talk, Curly keeps talking about in life, you've got to have that one thing. There's got to be that one thing that's most important in life. Well, New York State has always had that one thing, too. It's been a number of things over the years, but to be the, to truly be the Empire State, it's had a number of things going for it over the years. First, it had the greatest harbor in the world, in New York City. And then it had the Hudson River, which allowed it to distribute uh, goods from that marketplace and that port far and wide. Then they opened up the Erie Canal, and it got them all the way into the Midwest and beyond and into Canada and opened up all those markets. Then they had the Industrial Revolution that took place on the banks of the Hudson River. Then they had Wall Street that was in New York City. And now, quite honestly, New York State is between what the last great thing was, Wall Street, and what the next great thing will be. Nowadays, Wall Street can be in Topeka, Kansas next Thursday if it wants to be because of electronics. And we need to figure out what it is that we're going to do to keep us from being the empty state as opposed to the empire state. Because on paper, I will tell you that things do not look good for this state. And they not only don't look good for right now, they don't look good for a long time. And I don't want to make that kind of statement without backing it up, but let me tell you just a few things. And I was introduced, and I kid you not, these are the exact words I'm quoting. I was introduced to the Nassau Suffolk School Boards Association annual dinner last summer as, and I'm quoting, and now the Prince of Freak and Darkness, Dave Love. <laughs> so I want to leave you with some hope before we get done with this speech. But what I do want to tell you about is some, some of the challenges that we're facing as a state. We're one of the oldest areas in the entire nation. Okay, One of the first people to get here, we've developed longer. What that means for us now is we have one of the most aging infrastructures in the country. We're tucked up in the corner of the country, so businesses that want to locate here know they're going to have a lot of shipping costs no matter where they go. Whether they go south, west, north, it's a long way from anywhere from around here. We've got the highest heating and cooling costs because we not only get hot in the summer, we get cold in the winter, we've got tremendous diversity, and so that costs a lot of money. We are the highest taxed state in the nation, and, and this is a key point, everybody else, every other state, when they try to get out of the kind of debt and fiscal crisis that we're trying to get out of, they've imposed some new tax in order to do that. There are a number of states that don't have an income tax, there are some that don't have a sales tax, some that don't have an estate tax, some that don't have corporate taxes. New York State imposes every tax that every other state in the union imposes, and it already imposes them at the highest levels in the country. Okay. That puts you up against the wall when you're trying to deal with a fiscal crisis like this. And it's really that and the next factor, the two things that make us come out of recessions much more slowly than other states. And the other, the other factor that causes that is the fact that we're also the most highly in debt of states in the country. We've spent a lot of our kids' money and grandkids' money to pay for things that we've wanted now or wanted so far. Okay. Well, when you've got shifts, like we have tremendous national recession, like you have, and you still have to sustain that high level of debt no matter what else happens, because once you default on that, it's tremendous fiscal chaos for a state. And so in order to avoid that, you've got to pay that off first. You'll notice they're starting to pass budget bills Yesterday, earlier this week, the very first one that they that they that they passed was to make sure that they had the state's debt service paid off. So you've got the highest taxes, you've got the highest debt. We educate, and here, here's the good news. We are one of the best states in the country at educating our young people in total and educating them through college in particular. What's happening now is we're exporting those kids after they get out of college. And most states lose their kids after college. That's not unique. Kids go to the military, they go to school in another state. But in other states, they come home again. In New York State, our kids aren't coming home. I'll give you the perfect example. My own family, they're, they're not going to be having the little family reunion at Dave's house anytime soon. My folks retired. This is such a classic example. They sold their house in New York. House values in New York were great. With the money that they had from that one house sale, they bought a house in Arizona for the winter and they bought a house in Maine for the summer. The taxes in total on those two houses are half what they were on their house here in New York State. Okay? That's the fiscal climate that we're fighting. When our kids go elsewhere to go to school or they go elsewhere to find, to find jobs, like my two sons, 
the one that just graduated from Johns Hopkins, his master's is in global security. He's not going to be working in all of it. Okay? And the other one's at RIT as a photojournalism major, and I'm guessing he's not staying. My brother was Salt Lake City's teacher of the year for the past few years, but he taught for 14 years in Schuylerville, New York, and we don't have him there anymore. And my sister went to Augusta, Maine. Okay? We lose a quarter of a million people a year, largely college educated, and we are immigrating, having immigrating into New York State. The equivalent number of people, we aren't losing population, it's a, it's a static population, but the people that we're gaining are not as highly educated and not as immediately able to contribute to the economy as the kids that we're losing. Now, you get high taxes, high debt, decreasing student enrollment, and a changing population like that, and I've got a highfalutin term for it, and I've got a really everyday term for it. The highfalutin term is the hydraulic descending centrifugal force of a porcelain receptacle. <laughs> Circle in the bowl. Ask any goldfish, it's tough to get out of that bowl. So what happens when you hit that kind of a fiscal crisis and you're trying to sustain a $57.5 billion enterprise? That's what New York State pays for public education. I don't agree with the governor a lot, but when he says that we pay a lot for public education in New York, he's not kidding. $57.5 billion is twice what GE makes worldwide. $57.5 billion is more than the gross domestic product of a bunch of nations on the planet. Okay? And we already spend that on public education here. And we have this fiscal projection that everybody from the governor's office to the legislature to the state education department to the tax and finance department of the state all agree on the exact same figures. i got to tell you, that is unique in my experience. Okay? To have all of those entities agree, but what they all agree is we're going to have a $20 billion gap between what we've got and what we need to pay for in public education within five years. That's an inordinate amount of money to try and make up. Okay. So that's what we're facing going into this now. To bring it down to the reaction that school districts have had over the past few years, how they've tried to cope with that, let's take a look at what school districts have faced over the past, let's say, four or five years. Four years ago, the state of New York stopped giving school districts more money. Four years ago. So every dime of every increase that this school district has experienced over the past four years has been paid for by local taxpayers and the federal government. The federal government pumped in $700 million or so, actually up front about $2 billion worth of federal stimulus money. That money's gone after this year. It expires at the end of this year. The state of New York hasn't put any more money in three years ago, two years ago. Last year had one of the biggest aid cuts in history, in anybody's history, a billion three. And it actually cut the same amount the year before, but they backfilled it with federal money. So they, they're actually, when they now say, knowing that the federal money has expired, they've got more than $2 billion that they've cut that's now being faced by school districts in trying to figure out what do you do at the end of, of all of that kind of meat grinder that's happened. Now that federal money's gone. The state of New York is talking about putting $805 million back in, which is about a third of what they cut from school districts without providing for any inflationary increases. We're now back at 2007 funding levels for schools. Now think about what's gone up in that time period. School district costs are 70 to 75 percent are wrapped up in personnel. And personnel costs are, it's not just the salary of your, your instructional and non-instructional staff. Those are contractually obligated as increases over time. But the required ones that you can do nothing about are the state pension system, which has been going up in double digits for the, well, during that entire time period. Because when the market tank, which caused less state aid, it also caused the retirement system to lose a bunch of money, so they started charging all of the municipal employers, including school districts, a lot more money than they had been paid in the retirement system. So at the same time that you're getting no money from the state, your money is now decreasing from the federal government. You've got double-digit increases for the pension system. You've got double-digit increases for health care that have gone up for, in double digits for as long as I can remember, which I can't understand, especially for school districts, quite honestly, um, because people who work in school districts are not 
the demographic of people who have high health care costs traditionally. Okay? I mean, they're 20 to 60. Okay? That's not the demographic where you typically have high costs. But nonetheless, costs have gone up in double digits. We all know what the price of diesel fuel is, and when you start running buses 10 hours a day, five, six days a week, it's a big increase in your heating oil and obviously and the other costs of school districts. So with all of this put together, all of those kind of costs <coughs> have been borne by the school districts, and now we have this, this new and interesting development, which is trying to recognize the, the fiscal exhaustion of the taxpayers of the state of New York. And so they voted to have a tax, a quote, and I'm using quotes here, a tax cap imposed, because it doesn't cap taxes at all. It puts a limit on the tax levy that the district can, can levy. But when people get bills that say something other than 2% next year, they're going to think they've been lied to, and anything is any further from the truth. They've done exactly what they were required to do but people's individual taxes have not been capped. But New Yorkers, 80% wanted a tax cap. Well, in my experience, you can't get 80% of New Yorkers to agree to continue breathing, okay, <laughs> politically. So when they say that 80% of them wanted a tax cap, the legislature acted. They're going to have to figure out what happens as a result of that very quickly. Because I know, well, Amsterdam, Corning, Schuylerville, where my brother used to teach, and the city of Schenectady, that tax cap calculation, which is supposed to be under 2%, actually allows them to raise less money this year than they raised last year, under, their, the, under the formula that they have to work through. And if your local district budget isn't passed, uh, you go back to zero. You're not allowed to raise a penny more than you spent in the previous year. And with all of those increases, the state of New York has set up a system quite honestly, by not recalibrating its cost for the existing revenues that it has available to it, what it's done is force school districts to react to this fiscal crisis in only one way. They have only one way to deal with this, and that's to lose programs and services and the people that provide them, because 70% of their costs are all wrapped up in people. So when the school district is faced with 500,000 of a deficit um, or a million dollars of a deficit, all you do is add up the number of people and then start figuring out where the state of New York tells you you're legally allowed to cut. Because quite honestly, most of the curriculum is now state required. And so there are very few, and I, and I will say this, and I, I try not to editorialize these things, but I will say this. There are reasons kids have to go to school, and there are reasons kids are willing to go to school. And the things that are required and the things that are not required, to me, are equally important. The things that are not required, if you listen to the educational experts, the, the most recent educational experts, they will tell you that music and, and uh, art and extracurricular activities provide the context that puts everything else into a usable perspective. Okay? If you have a group of kids who are tremendous readers, but they don't know baseball. And you put them next to a control group of kids who can't read worth a darn, but they know baseball. And you give them a test on baseball, who do you think gets the bigger score? Okay, Because they've got the context to be able to put that in. If you ask city kids about milking cows, what do you think you're going to get on a test for? Okay? So you've got to have that context. And so the, the broader array of, of curriculum is very important. And I will tell you, I know that you're struggling with that type of thing here. I can tell you that there are 200 out of uh, 646 school districts in New York State. There are 200 of them, almost a third, that have, have already indicated that they are in what they consider to be, or will be at the end of this year, under educational insolvency. They pick that term because they're municipal entities and they're not allowed to go bankrupt. Okay, but that's what they're talking about. They're talking about their schools are educationally bankrupt because they can't provide even the state required curriculum, let alone all the things that make sense out of the state required curriculum. There are school districts in this state, largely poor rural districts, that can't raise $100,000 under the tax cap. And you know what kind of cost increases I've just described. So all they can do is continue to cut people. Now, the governor has said 
it's time to quit talking about mergers and consolidations. And that's their, their response, is that these people, if they can't provide it, they should just merge and consolidate, and then you'd be able to do that. Well, I don't want to be crass, but if you take four poor rural districts and you put them all together, you get one big ass poor district. That's what you get, okay? And then kids stay on a bus for a long, long time. And there's nothing educationally sound about that, and there's certainly nothing that promotes the community about taking their one remaining vet last vestige of community away from them, which is the school, and in the rural community in particular, that's the case. So those are the kinds of things that, that we're facing. <coughs> so even when we get back to the point, as we're apparently doing this year, as we're hopefully doing this year, where the state of New York starts to, to put some money back into the process, they've got that result to deal with. The state of New York last year said, we've got a $10 billion deficit, and we need to take it from all areas. We spend a third of our money on public education. Part of that money has to come from public education, and so we have this thing called the gap elimination adjustment, and which I don't want to give you a technical explanation, but basically they give you state aid with their left hand, and they take it back in the right hand to, to deal with their own deficit. Okay. Well, as long as you're doing that, school districts can't cut fast enough to make up the difference. That's the easiest way I can put it. They don't have enough. They don't have enough tax base to be able to do it locally. And quite honestly, even if they did have the tax base to do it locally, now we have a tax cap that, that makes it extremely difficult. I wish you could all see the language that you have to use if you're going to exceed the cap. It, it actually, you know, in my mind, I mean, it's legalese, and I'm a lawyer, but when I read it, it tells you about six ways to Sunday. If you're an idiot, feel free to vote for this. Okay, that's the actual ballot language, let alone the way that you have to present it. So, so it's a very difficult situation, but the state of New York not only cap the local funding, it capped its own funding. It tied the, the growth that it's allowed to give to local school districts at the rate of personal income growth. And that makes sense in, in theory, except that personal income growth and the expenses there aren't in any way tied to school district expenses. And so what they do is they limit themselves to avoid what the governor calls profligate spending on education. They limit themselves to $805 million this year, about a third of what they've cut. They take back money for the gap elimination adjustment. They limit the amount that the local community can raise. And they tell the school district about three quarters to 85% of what they have to teach in the school district, and then they tell them to deal with it. So I don't know the specifics of Newburgh. But I know the generalities of school districts I've heard every place. And what they typically do is they put up a list of all the possible things that they're allowed to cut. And they say, this is our universe. Because otherwise we break the law if we cut, if we cut the other thing. Well, to me, that list, that's the side of the ledger of all the reasons kids go to school. Okay? I wouldn't have showed up a day for school if I spent the day doing math. Right? If I could have done math, I wouldn't doing this, I would have been adopted. So school districts facing this kind of pressure try and cope with, you know, with the state pressure. They try and cope with what's happening at the federal level where, they're, where they've got tremendously more standardization. This movement to try and make sure that it doesn't matter whether you're in Montauk or in Montana, if it's Tuesday, we're all on page 52 type of thing. And they've got legitimate reasons for wanting to do that. They want to raise the national standard of excellence to be able to compete with other countries. That much is understandable. Really tough to do to become more efficient at the same time that you're trying to become more educationally effective. And the good news that I'll give you is that Quality Counts, which is a think tank, a national educational think tank, and Education Week, which is the publication of public education for the week, we did a study across 52 different measures for public education all the way across the country. On one of the studies, New York State came out second, and on the other one, it came out third. So I want to tell you how good your school and 95% of the school districts have to be. Think about this. We're second and third in the country. <clears throat> the, the number the governor uses is an arcane figure. He says we're 38th in the country in the results. The number that he's using is a 2,000 census number which is a percentage of adults that, um, that have a high school diploma that received them in New York State. Okay. 
Well, if you've got that kind of a high turnover, that becomes a really bizarre figure. <coughs> if you've got a high immigrant population, that becomes a really bizarre figure. So to say that, you know, what he's trying to say is we're not getting the, the results we need for the money. Well, even if you agree with the premise, you can't really base it on the kinds of things that, that we're doing to ourselves right now. It's true that we spend more than any other state per child. That is true. But it's the old argument, you know, we've got some places that spend $45,000 per kid. And we've got others that are spending $8,000 per kid per year. So we've got one foot in boiling water and one foot in ice water and saying on average we feel fine. Right? To say that, for the governor to say that we spend this amount of money, but we're not getting results because we're 38th in that measure, well, they've just redone the census, okay? And the state that improved the most over the last 10 years is New York State. Okay? So we've got, we've got that to think about. But the main reason I want to I wanna say that you've got reasons to be, to be proud of yourselves, quite honestly, is that Look at the results in New York City, in Buffalo, in Rochester, and in Syracuse. A third of our kids are failing in those areas. Okay? And now, I, I didn't, I'm going to give you a misimpression if I look. The children in those areas comprise a third of our kids, and all of those kids are failing. That's what I want to tell you. Okay? So a third of our kids are severely academically challenged, and yet, Statistically, our state as a whole is still second and third in the country. Think about how good you've got to be to overcome that kind of statistic. It's phenomenal. So if you aren't in those particular school districts, and I feel for what they're dealing with in those school districts, but the people who are outside of those school districts are doing phenomenally well to make up for that statistical disadvantage. So to me, that says that what we're doing is worth preserving to the extent that we can preserve it. But it makes it very difficult within the, in the construct of what the federal government has established and what the state has determined are going to be the resources. Now, to me, what the state has, has said needs to happen is you need to become more efficient. Okay? And the kind of things that I've heard described here, closed schools, relocate places, lease buildings, um, preserve the programs despite the fact that you've had to consolidate them. Those are exactly the type of things that you would want to have happen. The problem is that at some point, you get to the point where you either provide what's required by the state or you don't. Okay? And when you get to that point, the state has a determination to make, not the local school district. Because the local school district, quite honestly, here's, here's the part that I don't like to talk about because I represent the school boards, locally elected officials, so we're all for local control. Okay. We're all for trying our best to translate the hopes and dreams of a community and its specific desires for its own children into an educational program that allows them to achieve those dreams. That's what we try and do. The fact of the matter is I'm one of the few people who can tell you with, with legal specificity because I was the Home Rule Council, there are only a few things in the state of New York that are required. They're called larger state interests. And even if the, if the state decides to administer them locally, it's still the state, and public education is one of them. You know how they talk about the campaign for fiscal equity, the CFE court case that required the state of New York to spend more money because it wasn't providing enough money to meet its constitutional obligation? Well, it's in the Constitution. That means that it's not Newburgh that has a constitutional obligation to provide public education. You know, there shall be a system by which all the citizens of New York State shall be educated. That's in our state constitution. It's the state's responsibility. And they've chosen to carry out that responsibility through a system of local school districts with locally elected officials and, and structured like it is now. If the state can't maintain that system and it can't adequately educate its kids, that's on the state. Okay? And at least in my mind, we're at that point. Now, I will say this about the way that they've, they've structured this budget. They put money back in, and they tried to do it in a way that has tried to address those districts that have been most harmed, because quite honestly, that gap elimination adjustment, there were some serious miscalculations when the governor did that last year. They said, we're going to take the gap elimination, you know, what they're taking back with one hand, we're going to take that out of operating aid. Well, who gets the most operating aid? 
the poorest school districts, the one who don't have any local property tax base. So that's how they did it last year, and he got really beaten up politically for taking the most money from our poorest school district. So he said, okay, we can't do that this year. Well, you also can't take it from your richest school districts because they don't get operating aid. They get about 10% state aid, right? They get their money through special ed aid, what they call the reimbursables, proceeds aid, transportation, building aid, and special educational aid. So if you can't take it from the rich and you can't take it from the poor, where are you going to take it? <laughs> you guys. Okay. Right in the middle. The people who are, who are average, kind of suburban school districts. That's, and, and a large school district like that with those demographics gets hit the worst. So it's been, you know, it's been difficult going up until this now. Just today, you know, they released the school aid funds and they tried using that $800 million and, and they did a good job of trying to create predictability because one of my biggest complaints has always been that school districts find out so late in their budgeting process what they're actually getting that it's very hard for school districts to do any planning. Well, last year they started doing two-year budgeting, and they'd said 805 million all the way back at this time last year. So we had had plenty of time to try and plan if they had been specific enough about it. But then the governor came out and said, "Well, I want 250 million of that to go to competitive grants, and we're not going to tell you how we're going to structure those grants and who can apply and what the criteria is going to be." So nobody had any predictability. But what they have done is they've reduced the amount of the gap elimination adjustment, they've put more money into operating aid, they've maintained those reimbursables, and everybody is supposed to get about a percent and a half more. Well, that's about half of inflation, so it's not covering it, but it's better than they're poking the eye with a sharp stick, which is what they've been doing for the last four years. Okay? So that's where we are. That's kind of the context of, of what school districts have been dealing with over the past several years trying to find out how to do what we've always done with diminishing resources in an age when we really can't expect to have increasing resources to any significant degree. So people are planning for doing less. I will tell you that there are some exciting things that are happening in public education that if we can hang on long enough that, that they're going to reach us. Um, I got an opportunity to hear about a, a couple of them, one of which is distance learning. Most of us, when we think of distance learning, we think of, okay, we can't afford to, to provide a course, but we can get a, a teacher somewhere and beam them into a classroom, and maybe there's an aide in the classroom, and everybody watches the, the class on TV. That's very much the last generation of distance learning. Distance learning for the whole, the whole cadre of vendors that are out there waiting for public education to make the investment to get into this is more like Think of your kids and trying to pry them away from Call of Duty, okay, those kind of simulations. Think about the simulations that the military uses or that pilots use or that um, a surgeon, a med school would use to electronically simulate surgery. And those kind of simulations are so good that they will elicit the same autonomic response in the surgeon as if they were operating on a live body. Okay? They can put a soldier into a simulated combat situation and the heart and the brain, all the systems operated exactly the same way as if it were happening for real. Those are the kind of experiential, active learning things that are possibilities for public education out there. The other thing that I, that I heard this past summer that I thought was tremendous is something called the flipped classroom. I had two science teachers out in Colorado that decided instead of giving their lesson every day, and then giving homework every night since their kids were on their computers all night anyway. They come in first thing in the morning and they film, they video their lesson and they put it online. And the homework every night was to go home and watch the lesson. Watch the classroom experience on your, on your laptop at home at night. This, the classroom time, everybody had to come in with four questions. And with those four questions, they could gauge the level of understanding from the night before. And they put them into groups and figure out, it almost ended up like everyone had an individualized education plan because you, you didn't have to slow down for, for the kid that had the least understanding. You, didn't, you, know, you could speed up for kids that understood more. You could figure out pretty precisely where people were and what they needed to go forward and put them into activities that allowed them to learn rather than simply sitting. So those are the kind of things that are out there. If we can hang on long enough, 
to be able to recalibrate our expenses with our, with our actual revenues coming in and figure out some other way of trying to deal with the fiscal crisis other than losing the programs and services and the people who provide them, which is the only way that they've given us so far. So with that, I'll try and, I'll try and wrap it up and allow you guys to ask some questions for a while if you have any, and then I'll let everyone get on to the business at hand. Have questions or did I bludgeon you today? <laughs> That's an absolute first. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, part of the fiduciary decision making would cover um, giving raises to people and then cutting teachers and like, raises that happen in administration while cutting teachers and teaching assistants and those folks who are responsible for delivering the state mandated curriculum. Yeah, there's, there's obviously wise stewardship uh, on the local level. And then there's the legal constraints that you have to operate within when, while you're trying to exercise that wise stewardship. Now, you know, everybody expects local officials and administration to exercise that kind of wise stewardship with, with public finances. That's, that's a gift. And quite honestly, we're one of the few states where you have public approval of the budget directly. I think there's only six of them in the country that have any kind of public vote on their budget. And in most states, they vote on the town budget and then the town pays for education out of that. That's how Massachusetts does it. And I think only New Jersey and New York State have the community vote directly on the budget. So obviously you've got to create tremendous community trust in how you're handling finances. The fact of the matter is that New York State has some fairly significant um, constraints on how school districts are allowed to do that. Um, we have the contractual bargaining situation, and you've probably heard of the Triborough Amendment. Um, the Triborough Amendment says that the old contract stays in place until the new contract is signed and all the provisions that were paid in the old one have to be paid until the new one is signed. So in an economic downturn, where you're looking to have this contract cost you less than the last one, it's very difficult to do because one of the parties that has to bargain, if they stay, if they stay in pat and do nothing, they make out better than if they sign a new contract. And so it's difficult to bargain backwards like that. And when your costs are so much wrapped up in personnel, that creates a kind of a disincentive over the, I don't want to say a pull over the whole process, but it dramatically impacts the entire fiscal situation of the school district. So, you know, I'll, while many school districts have had um, really good um, rapport with their bargaining units that reflect the fiscal realities of the district, I will tell you this, that even in those districts where they have asked, let's say, the teachers to take a 0% raise, which is, my own wife did that. She said, I'm gonna lose my colleagues if I, you know, if we don't do this. So I'm willing to do that. I'll take a zero to try and keep them because I need them, type of thing. Even when that kind of thing happens, district-wide, it's not enough. It's simply not enough. The health care and the pensions go up anyway, beyond the salaries, and you know, pensions are 11% by themselves of, of all of those salaries. So 11% of 70%, healthcare 10% of 70%. So you've got 21% that's embedded if you do nothing that has to go up. You know what happened to diesel fuel. There are all these things that happen, and I know what you're saying is, in essence, how can you cut this, that, or that program if, if you know, your administrators are taking raises or your bus drivers are taking raises and that type of thing. I don't, I don't know. If you're What I'm telling you, and this is the part that's hard to hear, but I'm telling you this, I, I know nothing about Newburgh in particular. I'm telling you this on a statewide basis. School districts can't cut that much to deal with this fiscal crisis. You can't do what you described, even if, if you did it perfectly, and get out of the situation. There just isn't enough money that they've cut more money, and they've limited more money, than that amount of money will generate for you. That's the difficult part of all of this. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, you know, the rising cost of the mind is health care, is pensions. And 
you said this is going to be bad for five years. How in five years, worst case scenario? Well, we spend, let's say we spend $60 billion, okay, because this year is 57.6 and we're going to Mr. Little, I'm sorry, can you repeat his question? Because sure. I don't think everyone heard. He was looking for a worst case scenario. He said, I, I described that it would be bad for five years if we did nothing, that we'd have this $20 billion gap, and he asked me to describe that situation a little bit. With pensions going up at the rate they are, and health care going up at the rate it is, and having restrained revenues, and knowing that there's going to be that, you know, we spend, let's say, $60 billion, and we're going to have a $20 billion gap within five years, that's significant. I mean, even saying that, that we would normally be spending 80 at that point, and we're going to have a $20 billion gap, that's one in four people that works in this school district being gone. That's one in four programs that you've got that's gone. That, that's the kind of fiscal crisis that we're talking about unless, and there are a couple things. Everybody says, you know, well, we need to, you know, the state has to prioritize. Well, it does. And there are all kinds of things that the state does, and nobody wants to eliminate any of them. You know, we do roads and bridges, and, and we do public um, safety programs. You know, you've got the state police, and you've got the court system, and you've got Medicare, and you've got a whole laundry list of social programs, but there's only one thing, quite honestly, there's one thing in the state constitution that says that the state must do, only one, and that's educate its kids, okay? So to me, there are two things to do. You know, you've got, you not only have to prioritize um, within revenues, well, that that's the first thing, because only the state has enough revenue to be able to address the situation. The localities no longer have it. The localities are spending about as much as they could possibly be expected to spend. I'll give you just an example. My, I'll tell you, this, this does not speak well to my son's sanity, but University of Kentucky wanted him to come play baseball, and he ended up going to University of Rochester Division III, paid about 45 grand a year. Right? I'll be thanking him for that through my retirement. So. While I'm out there, Patrick's going to play baseball with the University of Kentucky coach, and I'm getting my hair cut, and I immediately recognized the lady that was cutting my hair, definitely not from Kentucky. She was obviously from Long Island. There's only one accent like that. <laughs> so I asked her, I said, what are you doing in Danville, Kentucky? You know? And she said, I had a three-bedroom ranch that was my parents' house. I couldn't afford to keep it, so I sold it. And I bought a 17-acre horse ranch here. Three-bedroom ranch, 17-acre horse farm. And the comment that she made afterwards, I will never forget. She said, in New York, you're not allowed to have anything. That's how frustrated taxpayers are. I understand the angst that went into doing the tax cap. I understand the angst in trying to restrain the local revenue. But I also understand that one thing. You know, when we get back around, because the part that I didn't say is in between all of those things that I described, since 1796, the one thing that's held New York State together that's attracted businesses in, no matter what else was ebbing or flowing commercially within the state, has always been public education. It's always been, if I want to bring my company here, I've got highly educated people, not just that can work and do what I want, but can, can significantly contribute to the future of my company, and, and this is important, my own kids don't have to go to private school, my own kids can get a great education in the public educational system. We've always had that. That's what's at jeopardy, and that's the one thing that's always distinguished us from every other state. If we look like every other state, and all people are thinking about are the cost of heating in the winter, cooling in the summer, transportation, high debt, high taxes, if that's all we offer, we're like every other state, and they won't choose to be here. You know, and quite honestly, I think the solution to your five-year problem is we've got to grow the economy back to be able to sustain this, and we've got to change the way we provide public education in a new and different age to recalibrate what we do with the fiscal reality that we're operating in. And I think once we've done that, then I think we've got a real shot at becoming the empire state again and preventing us from becoming the empty state. So with that, I'll let you go. I'll let these folks do their work. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Mr. Little.
your information was, was quite informative, I think, to all of us, and I truly appreciate you taking the time to come here and be with us and speak with all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> On the back table, um, I did have copies made of some frequently asked questions about the property tax cap, so um, if you didn't see those when you were coming in and you're interested, um, they are in the back of the room. Developing a school budget this season has been one of the hardest tasks that our board has undertaken due to the current financial restrictions, many of which you just heard about. You've heard Mr. Little and should realize that Newburgh is not the only district coping with such a large problem of reducing its programs for our children. We understand that during this process we cannot satisfy everyone, but will collectively do what we feel is in the best interest of all students, given the amount of funds that we have. We have listened to comments and suggestions throughout this process and strongly agree with many of them. However, at the end of the day, the only constant in the equation is the Albany mandated tax cap and the budget gap of over $15 million this law has created. The risk is too great to our program to not adopt a budget that conforms to this cap. I'd like to summarize and clarify some of the main points of the reductions to date. The percentage of positions eliminated by category are Administration, which includes central office, principals, APs, and directors, is currently at 10.53%. Teaching positions, which includes teaching assistants, is currently at 6.74%. And all other support staff is currently at 8.41%. We have reduced all supply lines in the district by 20%. We have reduced the total equipment lines by 10%. We have asked the unions to consider a change in insurance companies, which could save nearly $2 million. Central office, senior staff has voluntarily agreed to a wage freeze for the 2012-2000 school year. We understand that a budget will be adopted by Albany on time, and as of late this afternoon, we did receive the state aid runs. We received a call, we also received a call from Assemblyman Scartados. As of late this afternoon, with our state aid runs, We are, see, we are seeing brought back to the district from the state $1.13 million. And with Assemblyman Scartados' money, to an additional $250,000. That would be a total coming back to the district to restore cuts of $1.3 million. We will address the additional revenue that we see and get uh, final confirmation of all that and will hopefully be able to restore some of the reductions that have been made. That will be addressed at our final April 18th final budget meeting which will be held at Newburgh Free Academy. At this time, Mr. Pasella, if you could give a review of where we are. Thank you, Madam President. To date, in the three meetings that you've had so far, by consensus, you've agreed to 125.5 positions to be eliminated, $10.5 million in reductions. Tonight, being presented are an additional nine items to close out the budget gap, to bring it down to zero within the cap, as you mentioned earlier about the $1.384 million Due to time, the superintendent and senior staff couldn't get together and make recommendations. However, if you recall, um, I did ask for items 
from the board as to a prioritized list of those items that you'd like to be brought back. I do have a few of those. Um, you can discuss them or you can wait until I compile all of the data. And then at April 18th, senior staff will make a recommendation to you based on the uh, prioritized list that has been submitted to recover the 1.384 million additional revenue. I need to caution you though that this 1.384 million going back um, is all contingent upon the budget being passed. If the budget is not passed, then another 2.63 million will have to come out. We'll have to use that money. The 1.384 will be used to offset that 2.6. So again, you'll be up against uh, some hard-pressed decisions. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Casella. Our first item for discussion this evening is the school lunch fund. You've all been provided with a copy of the recommendations around that. You'll note that there's a request for a slight increase in meal prices while keeping the milk price flat. As with everything else in this economy, costs are rising, thus the reason for the increases. The fund balance accumulated over the years is sufficient enough to cover the anticipated loss of the operating school's cafeterias. Do I have questions or comments on the school lunch fund? I will take consensus on accepting. No. This will be put for you as a formal resolution in the April board meeting. This is just okay. for your information at this point. We just compiled this. Uh, okay. Mr. Calvano is in the uh, audience. If you have any questions, if you don't have any questions tonight, you can certainly compile them, send them to us, and then we can address them at the uh, board uh, workshop in April. So this would be something that would be um, adopted as a budget for the school lunch fund on April 18th, along with the other portions of the budget. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll go on to our next item, which is the Newburgh Free Library. As with the general fund, the Newburgh Free Library must adhere to the New York State tax cap laws. You will note that the amount of increase allowed for the library is slightly higher than the general fund budget. This is because of the pilot adjustments, payment in lieu of taxes, correct? Correct. This adjustment only affects the general fund as the library does not receive additional revenue for them. The proposed budget conforms to the maximum increase in tax levy revenue of 2.94%. questions at this time on the proposed budget for the Newburgh Free Library. This also would be brought before us for a resolution on April 18th. Next item for discussion this evening is the instrumental program. You'll see Schedule 15 in your packets. There were discussions surrounding the instrumental program starting in grade five versus complete elimination. It is now being recommended for the 2012-2013 to do as suggested and begin the instrumental program starting in grade five, thereby causing a reduction of two FTEs versus the original proposal which caused a reduction of six FTEs. Questions or comments on this? Okay. I will take consensus <coughs> on music, elementary music program to begin instrumental in grade five for a reduction of two positions and a reduction in the budget of $171,339. Ms. Prokash? Mr. Vesley? Ms. Resch? 
Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. <laughs> Our next item that's being recommended is around the grade six accelerated class. It's recommended to no longer offer an accelerated program at the grade six level. Instead, a grade six honors program will be designed. The specifics of the program and application procedures will be shared with all current grade five students and parents near the end of April. South Middle School, Heritage Middle School, Temple Hill Academy and Meadow Hill School will be offering a program designed to align with their unique school programs. The expectations and rigor of the programs will be defined by the district and entrance and exit criteria will be defined in the application process. I have questions or comments around this recommendation? Yes, Mr. Levenstein. This is just collapsing one classroom and offering an honors program in the four schools, with all the seventh graders. Sixth graders. Sixth graders, rather, sorry. Like the seventh grade and eighth grade program that's there, the honors program? I can't say that it'll be exactly like it for the process of designing it. Uh, we've done some research on local school districts, sixth grade honors program. As you know, the honors program at well, the sixth grade curriculum is very different than the seventh. So we have to take that into consideration. Uh, but we've had numerous requests from parents and the community to develop an honors program at the sixth grade level. So based on those recommendations, we've got a team sitting down to design that. Thank you. Other questions or comments around this recommendation? Okay, and I will take consensus on no longer offering an accelerated program at the grade six level and the creation of a grade six honors program. That would result in a reduction to the budget of $83,165. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokosh? Yes. Our next item for discussion is the community resource officer. The district secured a grant in the amount of $70,000 specifically for the community resource officer position at NFN. The additional funds will be absorbed by the extended day school violence prevention grant. So that position will no longer be funded out of the general fund budget. That would be a reduction of $100,000 to the general fund budget now that it will be covered by grants. Can I have comments or questions around this recommendation? We like that. I'll take consensus of the community resource officer being funded through grants with a reduction to the budget of $100,000. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokosh? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Yes. item we have is a shifting of expenses to grant sources. That would be a reduction in the budget of $496,033. We have a memo on this. in-depth review of district grants from Title 1A, Title 2A, and Title 3 prove that the cost for instructional coaches can be absorbed 
from the general fund. These positions will be slightly adjusted in their duties to include professional development, which is a main criteria for the Title I grants to absorb some of these costs. Again, it would be a reduction in the general fund of $496,033 by shifting the expenses of this to grant sources. Questions and comments on this recommendation? Yes, Ms. McAfee. What was the grant money being used for? Okay. Some of that grant money was already used to fund those particular positions. Um, some of it was used for materials resources. Um, as we move forward and embedding professional development into the classroom as opposed to pulling them out, we're seeing that there's a better opportunity for us to shift these funds to support this personnel so that we're not pulling classroom teachers out of their classrooms next year. We're pushing support into the classroom. So it's a it's kind of a balance um, effect that as we speak. But it doesn't mean that we're kind of doing teachers or math. No, absolutely not. questions or comments on this recommendation? Okay, then I will take consensus on the shifting of expenses to grant sources for a reduction in the general fund budget of $496,033. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the next item for discussion is a reduction in freshman sports for a savings of $54,900. As mentioned in prior meetings, having calculated the cost of the freshman level teams, you'll find on attachment sheet 23, a handout at the March 22nd workshop indicated that local schools that still have freshman teams. Because most districts have not approved their budgets yet, it is unknown how many will retain this level of sports for the 2012-2013 school year. In addition, uh, not mentioned here, it would allow us to put back the modified sports that we had agreed by consensus would be reduced at the last meeting. So the modified sports would go back and the cuts would be at the freshman level for a reduction of $54,900. Comments on this recommendation? Yes, Ms. Resch. So what we'd be doing, we'd be having modified, and then we'd have no freshmen, and then we'd have the varsity again, right? JV and varsity. So the modified So there's going to be a gap in between there. One year. The, the, they can always try out for JV and varsity sports. So there's no limitation on that? No. Okay. And also, um, in the past, it was only freshmen for one year, so they were going modified freshmen for one year and then right. on to JV and varsity. Okay. So it would just eliminate that, and they would have the same opportunities to try it's out. It's going to be JV. more competitive. Right. Okay. Cool. Any other questions on this recommendation? Okay. I will take consensus on the reduction of freshman sports for a reduction in the budget of $54,900. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Vesley? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Yes. next items on our list are around health insurance, workers' comp, the tax certiorari, and unemployment. 
We've received notification from New York State Association of School Business Officials that a restricted use of reserve fund labeled employee benefits and accrued liabilities will have the restrictions lifted for the 2012-2013 school year. It was confirmed late this afternoon from the governor that this is true and that this re reserve could be used to offset expenses. It is our recommendation to reduce the operating expenses of workers' comp, property tax refunds, and unemployment down to a zero budget. The remaining amount of the reserve is to be used to reduce the health insurance budget. You will note on Schedule B that this reserve had a balance of $2,255,861. The reason why these expenses are being recommended is because we will once again be held to a property tax cap for the 2013-2014 school year. These lines will not affect that cap as it will be my recommendation to fund payments using the existing reserve balance for those expenses and thereby not increasing the budget. So the recommendation is to shift this and use the reserves for a savings of $2,255,861. Questions or comments on this? Yes, Mrs. McAfee. I love the idea of having this $2,255,000 to spend on things that, that we want to save. But if I had $2 million in my savings account, that belonged to my family, and I used it, what would I do when a rainy day came? In other words, my concern is, aren't we going to have to pay this back at some point? Mr. Pacella? No, these, these, this reserve was set up by the governor, I'm sorry, by Albany legislators, to, start, to sort of fund the accumulated sick time of all active employees. It's really a post-employment uh, benefit that I think Albany's finally realizing that you really will not be using it. Uh, it's sort of as if the school district did go bankrupt or in, uh, into solvency, as described by Mr. Little, you'd have to pay back all of those accrued sick days that employees have accumulated. Us in the business world know that that's not going to happen. So I guess they're releasing those restrictions to fund it. This two million two hundred fifty-five thousand is far less than our required amount to fund this. Um, I think the the work the Compensated absences total is about 26 million. So the, the original intent of the law this is, is the yeah, it's not even it's not even 10 percent of where we should be. Um, would we have to pay it back? Yeah, in some disastrous type of scenario, but not within our lifetime. <laughs> Other questions or comments around this recommendation? Then I will take consensus on the reduction to the general fund budget of $2,255,861 around the health insurance, workers' comp, tax tertiary, and unemployment. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Mr. Vesley? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. That's all we have for discussion tonight. Um, we did receive um, some feedback, as Mr. Pasella mentioned, around the um, wish list and prioritizing um, for those things that might be restored if we came into money. Um, I've shared with you that we, uh, it appears that we've come into $1.3 million. Um, I did not receive all of the wish list, or I should say Mr. Pacella did not receive all of the wish list. So I would like to um, request that my board members, um, the rest of them that haven't already done so, please provide that to um, Mr. Pacella so that uh, we will have that for discussion at our next budget workshop meeting now that we know and will be able to verify that we do indeed have $1.3 million worth of reductions that we can put back. The next budget workshop meeting is currently scheduled for Wednesday, April 18th at 7 p.m. There will be a special meeting to adopt the budgets 
for the school and also for the library. It will be held by the NFA at the NFA main campus auditorium. It will be followed by the workshop, the Board of Education workshop for the month of April. Mr. Pacella, do you have anything to uh, wrap up this evening and where we stand or? Sure. So far by consensus, you have closed the budget gap over $15 million combined. Uh, tonight, you agreed to another three positions for a total of 128.5 uh, positions, um, which is spread across, across the, all three units. The administration seeing a 10.53% reduction, teaching 6.74% reduction, and support staff 8.41% uh, reduction. We'll go back to uh, with senior staff and Mr. Pizzo to make the recommendation on the 1.4, 1.384 million that we did receive based on the information or the recommendations I received from the board on your prioritized list. The board hereby recesses into executive session for the following purpose, to discuss the employment history of particular individuals. The board will not be taking action after the executive session. Can I have a motion? Roll call, please. Yes. Thank you all very much for being here this evening. Please enjoy your vacation if I don't get to see those of you before then. And have a great evening. Thank you.